Today, we're going to talk about performance anxiety and coping strategies. You know the old joke about how do you get to Carnegie Hall? A person in New York City gets into a cab and asks, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And the cab driver replies, practice. How do you get yourself ready to give a public performance for an audience? What goes into it besides practice? There are many facets to being a musician. Love of music is at the top. Lessons and practicing are another facet. But being on stage, well, there's also a certain amount of vulnerability that comes with that. Every performer experiences self-doubts sometimes about what he or she is about to present to an audience. So, what do we call this phenomenon? performance anxiety, stage fright, stress response, performing under pressure. They all refer to the same thing. Naming it is a good first step to learning to manage it. So what happens when a person experiences performance anxiety? In a 2015 article for the British newspaper The Guardian, the author David Cox explains the nervous system pumps hormones adrenaline and noradrenaline and cortisol into the bloodstream. When their levels get sufficiently high, it leads to physical reactions such as higher heart rate, muscle tremors, and increased blood flow from the stomach to the muscles, causing the feeling we describe as butterflies in the stomach. The first coping strategy I'm going to share with you is the easiest, a change in your diet. Are you eating or drinking stimulants, caffeine? Then you're setting yourself up to have a higher heart rate even before performance anxiety kicks in. Lay off the Red Bull, cut back on caffeine. Almost every soloist will experience the physical symptoms of music performance anxiety to some degree, particularly in the moments before walking on stage. Some people are better at performing under pressure than others, but everyone can learn strategies for handling pressure. Aaron Williamson, professor of performance science at the Royal College of Music in London, explains it's the way you interpret that different physical state which makes all the difference. Instead of seeing it as a signal that something's going to go wrong, you should treat the symptoms as a sign that your body is ready to perform. If controlled appropriately, these hormonal imbalances can lead to a heightened state of awareness and a more powerful performance. But, given the fine muscle movements and coordination behind musical technique, too much of the surging stress hormones can impair technique, leading to increased anxiety and panic, followed by concentration and memory lapses, and more stress. You know who has something in common with musicians on that score? That's right, athletes have a lot in common with performing artists. Both want to achieve peak performance, and that takes more than physical skills. It takes psychology, mental skills as well. Both athletes and musicians need to condition themselves through thoughtful practice to be able to deliver good results at a particular time. The big game happens on a specific date and time. The concert, the theater production, the speech, it's on a schedule for a specific date and time. Whether you wake up that morning feeling primo or a little off, you still have to make your best effort. The show must go on. 
Everybody has their own symptoms, which are instrument-specific, Ginsburg says. Pianists will talk about their fingers sweating or their hands feeling cold. String players will talk about their bows shaking. Singers refer to a dry mouth. But given the individualism of the symptoms, it takes time and experimentation and careful development of self-awareness to learn what coping strategies are most effective for you. To manage the cognitive and physical symptoms of performance anxiety. Here's another coping strategy. When you start a new piece, do some score study away from your instrument. Then, when you start to practice it, consider starting with the last page and work backwards in sections to get to the first page. That way, you're always playing into music you know, into familiar territory. The virtuoso pianist Rebecca Pennis, who was a child prodigy and taught on the faculty at the Eastman School of Music for many years and at the North Carolina School of the Arts before that, published an article in Clavier magazine titled Motion and Emotion in 1992. When Pennis talks about preparing for performance, she states, at best, performing takes getting used to. She then lists six stages of performing. The practice room is the first stage. The remaining five stages include private lesson, audience of one, master class or studio class, informal recital, and formal recital. Permission of your teacher is necessary for the latter stages. An expert can advise you if you're ready. Music performance anxiety, it's best to stop attempting perfection. Anxiety results when perceived challenge exceeds perceived skills. That's when you're intimidated and you imagine that the level of difficulty exceeds your ability, your skills, to complete the task at hand. Studies have shown that solo performances trigger higher rate of music performance anxiety than ensemble performances do. And it's easy to see why that would be. If you are one singer in a section of altos, one violinist in a section of second violins, one trumpet in a section of several trumpets. The others could cover if you fumble. But when it's just you, or in chamber music when there's only one on a part, you're more exposed and there's more risk. I've indicated the word perfectionism in red with a line through it. That's how strongly I want to send the message that Perfectionism is the enemy. Perfectionism results in an unhealthy fear of mistakes and all-or-nothing self-talk where the person can't seem to appreciate what went well, only the mistakes. A perfectionist is plagued with negative inner judges, it's better instead to realize that live performance typically includes some mistakes and to strive for excellence instead. It's important for you to realize that a commercial recording is usually heavily edited. A record executive with Columbia once pointed out that a typical piano album has a minimum of 100 edits. The recording sounds perfect. That same pianist in a live performance may sound less than perfect. It's one take when it's a live performance. Keep that in mind. Affirmations are positive self-talk. 
you can build these into your practice time and into your pre-concert routine. Here are some sample affirmations. These come from Gerald Klickstein's blog, The Musician's Way. Two very good books that discuss the psychology of musical performance are listed here. In your handout, I provide links to archive online copies. The campus library also has these books for checking out. I especially like to assign piano majors to read chapter 13 in Eloise Ristad's book. It's titled Clammy Hands and Shaky Knees. In this chapter, Ms. Ristad shares the example of a pianist she coached whose music performance anxiety symptoms included not only shaky hands, but the adrenaline of her MPA caused her nose to drip. Yikes. You'll want to read how Eloise Ristad helped Alice conquer her stage fright, how she taught her to shift her focus, and it solved the drippy nose, too. One of the psychological strategies Ristad suggests, if you're on stage and something goes wrong, find something specific to pay attention to that might be useful. Sense the soles of your feet, the middle of your back, your rib cage, your elbows. How can any of this help? Well, it takes you out of your head and puts you into your body. It makes a connection between you and something real, something you can see, hear, or feel. It rescues you from vague internal rumblings that distract you from your playing. It momentarily tricks you out of the left brain area of your head, which is playing judge and dictator again, and activates the right brain area that knows it knows the piece and doesn't waste time giving commands and making recriminations. Peak performance means that mistakes are few. Problems are recovered from quickly. Peak performance includes healthy self-reflection. Basically, it means balance. Here is a summary of coping strategies for MPA. Cognitive therapies such as creative visualization, meditation, mindfulness, and flow. Behavior therapies such as progressive muscle relaxation, desensitization through the stages of performance. That's what you're doing when you observe the six stages of performance. You may be nervous for each of the six stages, but if you perform your program or you perform a set or a particular piece in multiple stages, you get used to or you desensitize yourself to the symptoms of music performance anxiety. It's not that they completely go away, but rather it's that you recognize that having those symptoms doesn't mean that you can't perform your piece. And then we have a combination of cognitive and behavior therapy, where you're replacing self-defeating thought patterns with coping statements. Strategies to achieve peak performance include working with a trusted expert to identify some past peak performances. And of course, your trusted expert is your teacher in performance studies. Private awareness. Keep a performance log. How did you feel prior to and during peak experiences? Essentially, you're trying to tap into the communication network between mind and body. Consciously explore positive cognitive behavioral techniques. 
and experiment with techniques for managing MPA symptoms, since what works best for you may vary compared to what works best for someone else. MPA might mean fear of the unknown. Do you know how the piece goes? When you're standing off stage ready to walk out to perform, perhaps you doubt that you do know. Have you thought about your teacher's suggestions? Have you practiced performing? How many stages? If you've truly worked the plan and prepared, then you can trust that you are as well prepared as you can be, and then you have to take your leap of faith. Mindfulness and flow. Mihai Shikshant Mihai spoke about creativity and flow. When you focus on flow, on the optimal performance state, the goal is a state of ordered consciousness, enthrallment, and a balanced ratio of skill to challenge. You feel very much in the moment, you're responding to what's happening in your playing and around you, and you feel a great sense of expressive power. There are a variety of self-regulating techniques to use to achieve mindfulness and flow. Olympic athletes use these. Professional athletes use these. It's part of their training. Remember, deep, slow breathing relaxes the mind and body. Inhale slowly through your nose. Exhale slowly through the mouth. Breathe in comfort, breathe out relief. It sounds simple, but it works. Managing cognitive response can be accomplished through thoughtful affirmations, positive self-talk, and performance logs. Set mastery and performance goals. This can be helpful as part of the step-by-step -step process for getting ready for public performance. In his introduction to The Inner Game of Music, Barry Green writes, People play sports and play music, yet both involve hard work and discipline. Both are forms of self-expression which require a balance of spontaneity and structure, technique and inspiration. Both demand a degree of mastery over the human body. Since both sports and music are commonly performed in front of an audience, they also provide an opportunity for sharing the enjoyment of excellence, as well as the experience of pressures, fears, and the excitement of ego involvement. The point of the inner game of sports or music is always the same, to reduce mental interferences that inhibit the full expression of human potential. Some of you may find you are more nervous when you perform on stage for a large audience. Others may find that you're more insecure and self-conscious performing for a small audience of people you know because you worry about what they think of you. The question, who claps for you, is a very important one. At Florida State University, Dr. Cliff Madsen spoke frequently about this subject to music majors. He pointed out that the healthiest approach is to identify a small circle of trusted mentors. Those are the people whose informed opinion you trust. That includes your teacher, who can advise you on when you've reached the point that you've learned a piece securely and achieved a polished interpretation. Beyond that small circle of trusted mentors, don't worry about what people think. 
In these days of social media, we are literally bombarded with opinions. It has never been easier for someone to sound off, sharing their opinion on all manner of things. But a lot of that is just noise, not worth thinking about. People are entitled to their opinions, but you don't have to take those opinions in if they aren't part of your trusted circle. Uninformed opinions aren't worth your time or energy. Think carefully about who claps for you. Athletes have a game day routine. Careful thoughts on the amount of sleep, the amount of hydration, meals for energy that are easy on the digestion, and then mindset and mental visualization. A baseball player before an at-bat may visualize the mechanics of a good swing and do some slow motion swings. This is all part of the focused process to achieve flow. William S. Newman, a professor of piano at UNC Chapel Hill, required that any of his students who was preparing a recital had to come for their weekly lesson two weeks before the concert at 7 a.m. There was no negotiation. They had to show up for their lesson at 7 a.m. He was insistent. Do you know why he did that? Because he was trying to cure his students of over-practicing of warming up too much, of playing through the program too many times before performing it. In other words, he was trying to break them of the habit of wearing themselves out, trying to prove to themselves that they knew the program. You can wear out your muscles if you overpractice on the day of a concert. Essentially, what happens if you play through your program at 7 in the morning is that you have to rely on your subconscious. The degree to which you know the program in your subconscious is what reveals itself under those circumstances. And you can simulate this at any time of day. You could choose to play through your program at 3 p.m. and choose not to warm up and just, you know, show up, maybe play a scale and then do the program. But it's worth thinking about because over practice can truly undermine your ability to have enough energy for an inspired performance at the right time. Right brain and left brain thinking. One may think of brain functions as existing in two hemispheres, right brain and left brain. The right brain being the creative side, the left brain being the analytical side. In the practice room, engage consciously in left brain thinking. Ask yourself questions about the music. Analyze. Remember when we talked about those thoughts you have when you're standing off stage waiting to walk on? Those thoughts where you're wondering, wait, do I really know how this piece goes? Well, those questions are the ones you need to cover in the practice room. If you've covered those questions carefully, in thoughtful practice sessions in the weeks and months leading up to your performance, then it's very easy to reassure yourself when you're waiting off stage and remind yourself of the answers to those questions. On stage, trust that you've practiced enough. Let go. This is the place for right brain thinking. Respond in the moment mindful thinking. Too often, students engage in right brain thinking when they're by themselves in the practice room. When no one's looking, they feel relaxed. 
And then suddenly when they're in front of an audience, all of a sudden they get analytical and start asking themselves lots of questions. You can flip that around. You can use left brain thinking when you practice and then use right brain thinking and let yourself be creative in the moment for the actual performance. But you have to be consciously in the driver's seat about that. When I was an undergraduate at Northwestern, every freshman music major in 1981 was required to read Zen and the Art of Archery because of how it talked about peak performance. The marksman hitteth the mark partly by pulling and partly by letting go. There's that right brain thinking again. You have to let go. Years ago, when I participated in the Southeastern Music Festival, I heard a wonderful master class by the virtuoso violinist James Buswell. He holds the distinction of being the youngest soloist to perform with the New York Philharmonic at age seven. He said, yes, everyone gets nervous, but imagine that you're holding a beautifully wrapped present and you hand it to the audience. Think of your performance as a special gift you want to share with the audience. Let them enjoy unwrapping your gift. After all, you wouldn't give someone a present and then say, oh, you're probably not going to like it. So, for your performance, present the gift and let the audience take it in. The story of Chan Zhu An is an interesting one. I'd like to close with the video clip of a marvelous example of a pianist in the throes of performance anxiety. This is from 2019, the finals of the prestigious Tchaikovsky International Piano Competition. Chang Zhu An, only 20 years old, has walked on stage, seated at the piano, and he is expecting to perform two concerti. First, the Tchaikovsky Piano Concerto in B-flat, and second, Rachmaninoff's Rhapsody on a Theme of Paganini. Both concerti have only a brief orchestral introduction before the piano soloist comes in. Unbeknownst to Chang Zhu, there had been miscommunication backstage. Watch what happens when the conductor and the orchestra start to play the wrong concerto. That is MPA well managed. He reacted in a split second. It wasn't perfect, but he switched to the Rachmaninoff concerto and he performed it to the best of his ability. Chan Zhu An went on to win the audience favorite award. What a trooper. My friend Anne Gurry is a piano technician for the Jacksonville Symphony in Florida. She met him last spring and told me the story. What we're striving for is balance, equanimity. Acquiring better coping skills is a journey. It doesn't happen overnight. I've emailed you the handout so that you have the active links. I wish you all the best on your journeys.